So good evening everyone, Mars is okay here. I just want to have a relaxed conversation with us. And that conversation is actually, who sold Nigeria to the British? Who? Do you know how much it was sold for? This republic called the Republic, or rather Federal Republic of Nigeria was sold for 565,000 pounds in 19, sorry, 1899. There was a story done by, um, what was it called again? Uh, Cheta Ezenwa. I'm crediting this to them. That's the Guardian's, uh, the Guardian's uh, newspaper. They've done this story. The story has it that, you know, this is the first story of the oil war, which was fought. Do you, can you guess where that oil, uh, that war was fought? In the area that later became the Federal Republic of Nigeria. All through the 18th century, palm oil was highly sought after by the British. For use as an industrial rubricant for machineries, remember that the British was the first world's first industrialized nation. If you watch the uh, uh, Charlie Chaplin films, you will see, that's, by the way, that's my favorite uh, comics. So they needed, um, you know, resources such as uh, palm oil to maintain those machineries. Palm oil, of course, is a tropical plant which is native to the Niger Delta, to the um, today southeast and basically the old eastern region. Malaysians' dominance of this oil came a century later. By 1870, palm oil had replaced slaves trade as the main export of Niger Delta, or rather export of the eastern region. The area which was once known as the Slave Coast, at first most of the trade in that oil was uncoordinated with natives selling to those who gave them the best deal. Natives chiefs such as um, Jaja of Opobo, became immensely wealthy because of oil, palm oil. With this wealth, he became so affluent and he became very, very influential. However, amongst the Europeans, there was a competition for two, sorry, for who would get preferential access to the lubricative oil uh, trade. I think in 1879, if my memory serves me right, George Goody formed the United African Company called the UAC, which was modeled on the former Eastern Indian Company. Goody's effectively took control of the Lower Niger River by 1884, not the date. His company had only 13, uh, uh, 30 trading posts along the lower Niger. This monopoly along this area gave the British a strong hand against the French and the Germans that stopped at Namibia. In the 1884 Berlin Conference, the British called the area that the UAC operated in, including their you know, sphere of influence uh, after the Berlin Conference, when the British got the terms they wanted from one, you know, from the other Europeans, they began to deal with the African chiefs. Within two years, precisely, in the year 1886, Gordy had signed a treaty with tribal chiefs along the Benue River and um, the River Niger, while at the same time also penetrating the inland. This move 
towards the inland was against the spirit of verbal agreement that had been made to restrict the organization's um, activities to coastal regions. By 1888, the company name changed to National African Company and was granted a, a royal charter that was later incorporated. That charter authorized the company to administer the Niger Delta and all land around the bank of the Benue River and Niger Rivers. Soon afterwards, the company was again renamed. Can you guess about can you guess the new name? I think that's what many people know about. Sadly, history is no longer taught in schools in Nigeria. Guess the name. Voila, you might be right. The name of the new company was called Royal Niger Company, which survives as Unilever till this day that I speak to you. To local chiefs within these areas that are aforementioned, the Royal Niger Company negotiated and pledged free trade in the region. Free trade. Behind this, enter the private contracts on their, you know, basically where they had terms because, because of the deceitful private contract were often written in English and signed by local chiefs who never understood English. I mean, come on. The British governments enforced them. So, for example, I'll give you an example. Jaja of Opopo, when he, you know, when he tried to export palm oil on his own, was forced into exile for obstructing commerce. Have you seen that? In your land, what you produce, you want to export, you were forced into exile. As an aside, Jaja was forgiven in, 1880, in 1891 and allowed to return home. He died on the way back, poisoned with a cup of tea. That reminds you, the poisoning didn't start today. Remember how Abiola died? Just a pose. Let's go back. Seeing what happened to Jaja, some other natives began you know, to look more closely at the deals they, they were getting from Royal Niger Company. One of such kingdoms was the Nembe Kingdom. Who king, who, sorry, whose king, the, what they call the King Kokomingi, the 13th, ascended the throne in 1889 after being christened school teacher. Koko Mingi the tenth, King Koko for short, like most rulers in the yard, was faced with the Royal Niger Company encroachment. He also resented the monopoly enforced by the Royal Niger Company and tried to seek out favorable trading conditions with particularly the Germans in the Cameroon Germans. Remember, some part of the Cameroon as of that time was still part of Nigeria, which was later split, you know, split, you know, what they call the NCNC, which was later, you know, when they had their referendum, decided to join the other part of, of uh, Cameroon. By 1894, the Royal, Nigeria, the Royal Nigerian Company increasingly dictated whom the native could trade with and denied them direct access to the former market. In late 1894, King Koko renounced Christianity and tried to form an alliance with the Boni and Dupoma against the Royal Niger Company to take back the trade because that was theirs. These people were foreigners to them. Remember again, this is very significant because the Oboma joined up, but sadly, the Boni refused. A having of the successful divide and rule tactics that didn't start today. On the 29th of January um, 1895, King Koko led an attack on the Niger Delta Company headquarters, which was in Akasa in today's Bayasa State. The Pirudan raid, you know, that was done before the dawn, 
that raid had more than a thousand men involved. That was how our ancestors, they fought like men. King Kuku's attack succeeded in capturing that base. They lost about 40 men. King Kuku captured about 60 British white men as hostage, as well as a lot of goods, ammunition, and uh, uh, what they call the Maxim guns. Kuku then attempted to negotiate a release of the hostage in exchange for being allowed to choose his trading partners. He's not asking for anything. Just, I went into all this and lost my men just to make a choice. Give me the opportunity to make a choice. The British refused to negotiate with Coco. And he had 40 of his, you know, the, the hostages killed. The British reports claimed, you know, they are telling us, but um, according to their report, the Nimbi people ate them. On 20th of February, 1895, Britain's, Britain's Royal Navy under Admiral Bedford attacked Brass and burned it to the ground. Many Nembe people died. Smallpox, you know, smallpox finished off a lot of people. Until today, some people argue that that smallpox was actually um, chemically engineered. By April 19. Uh, 1895, business had returned to normal. Normal being the condition that the British wanted. So all the effort of King Koko amounted to nothing and King Koko was on the run. Brass was fined 500 pounds by the British. In today's money, it will be about 62,000 pounds. Converted to Naira, it will be about probably 20, 29 to 30 million. And the looted weapons by King Koko were returned, as well as the surviving prisoners. After a British Parliament commissioner sat, King Koko was offered terms of settlement by the British, which he rejected and disappeared. The British promptly declared him an outlaw. In today's war, if it was to be during Buhari, he would be declared a terrorist. And they offered a 200 pounds reward, which is about 26,000, about 12 million in today's money for him. But being a great king, he was like the Okonkwo in Things Fall Apart. In 1898, he committed suicide rather than die. About the time, another, you know, king, the Oba of Benin, was on the run or rather out of town for persecution of the lower Niger was well and truly underway. The immediate effect of this brass oil war was that the public opinion in Britain turned against the Royal Niger Company. So its charter was revoked in 18. Following the revoke of this charter, the Royal Niger Company sold its holdings to for. the British government at a holding to the British government by the Royal Niger for 865,000 pounds. In today's pounds, it will be 108 million pounds in today's pounds. Now, if you convert that today, it will be about 46 billion Four hundred and seven million and two hundred and fifty thousand. It is unbelievable. It is unbelievable. This is how much we were sold as a nation. This is the price the British paid for this nation called Nigeria where nothing works to buy the territory which was we you know which has become known as nigeria how did we get here yes our forefathers have tried our forefathers have done their best my heart 
my thanks goes to King Koko. He fought as a man. Judge of Opobo, you fought as a man. The fight to liberate our people is left for you and I. They fought militarily. We have tried militarily between the 1967 and 1970. Today, let's not make that same mistake twice. The battleground is shifted. Like our mentor, Juku always said, now it is what he called in his time, the Biafran of the mind. The strategy, the strategy is changed. Nigeria is not what we were told it is. Part of the reason history was removed from the school curriculums, we must continue to educate our people. Let us liberate the mind. When the mind is liberated, we we'll begin to ask questions. The questions that will lead us to answers. And once we have these answers, we will be free. Again, Mars is okay, as I keep demanding, nothing short of Aburi Accord, where regions are semi-independent, govern themselves, make their own laws, decide their future at their own pace. Nothing short of that is acceptable. Or a total dissolution of that first marriage will be demanded. I remain yours truly, Mazi Ezoke. Remember this. Mm -hmm.